I'll talk about something much more interesting, and that is the human imagination, which I see as a mental faculty equal to reason, but different and complementary. And this is not just an opinion, but it's something I'm, I'm going to try and, and uh, uh, show how, how exactly that works, how the, where the imagination actually arises. Um, now, there's few scholars in the Western tradition who've actually paid attention to the imagination. I've written a little bit about it in the past, and I've been inspired by my work in Indonesia. Another one is, uh, though, Henry Corbin, who's quite well known, and he has always um, reminded us of a self-imposed poverty in our present civilization, and I quote him. Western philosophy, drawn along in the wake of the positive sciences, has long admitted only two sources of knowledge. There's sense perception, which gives us the data we call empirical, and they are the concepts of understanding the world of the rational laws governing those empirical data. But as Corbin further notes, there's also active imagination, and I quote, which has its own noetic and cognitive function, which gives us access to a region and a reality of being, which without that function remains closed and forbidden to us, and whose disappearance brings on a catastrophe of the spirit. Corbin's active uh, imagination is reminiscent somewhat of the imaginatio vera, or true imagination, in the work of Paracelsus, and also to the Vedanta notion of kalpana, or creative imagination, which is seen as the world-creating faculty of the mind, or mana kalpita jagat. In this paper, I ask, how are we to understand this second mental function in scientific terms? How does imagination arise, and how does it relate to the current late modernist malaise in science and education? Now, I regard image, image formation or the forming of images, mental images, as the foundation of all subjective experience and consciousness in animals and, of course, most of all in humans. And I would like to argue that there are three kinds of images, those of the past, those of the seeming present, which is really the very recent past, because there's a delay between perception and image formation, and finally, those not of but for the future. In other words, I see normal consciousness ultimately as a bi-directional engagement with time. This is a rather strange assertion, I must admit, but let me explain why image formation is vital for the everyday subjective experience of change. Now, Combin's uh, inspiration was Persian philosophy. And he saw active imagination as a mediator between reason and the senses. I see it somewhat differently. I see the connection with reason, but I don't think um, um, the idea of a mediating function really captures what imagination does. And to clarify the role of imagination, I'd like to draw your attention to, to some very basic mechanisms of consciousness, which emerged rather early um, many hundreds of millions of uh, years ago in the evolution of life. Now, the three classes of images I mentioned, past, present, and future, correspond to memory-based reason, sensation, and imagination, and all three are vital cognitive functions. There were some uh, behavioral researchers, Alan Badley and Graham Hitch, who were the first to propose that uh, consciousness is based on, on working memory. That was in the 70s, and they were inspired by Vygotsky's idea of internalized speech. They were hoping to understand what we actually do with mem memory in the now and how that relates to consciousness. Uh, and they built on earlier work by two physiologists, Holst and Middlestead, who had the vital, vital research findings to explain this. The latter had made an important discovery about how animals perceive change or motion in the environment, which is something that animals must do to stay alive, irrespective of whether they're hunters or hunted. They found that animals continue, continuously create a multi-sensory mental image of what is happening now, 
they store that image in working memory briefly and then compare it with the next image created from what is perceived in the next now. Uh, animals thus create an internal loop through the past with the help of a continuous imaging function designed to detect change over time yeah, by comparing those images. And change means it could be a predator coming, it could be some prey that uh, might be of interest and so on. And by extension, certainly in humans, this imaging process also allows for the rational post hoc analysis of, this, of causal relationships between events. The word image is somewhat biased, I should mention, because uh, there are, of course, also auditory and olfactory elements that flow into this imaging process. Now, together, the imaging techniques of conscious beings are called afferent copy mechanisms. And the mechanisms concerned with storing observations of the outside world and thus creating a loop through the past is called ex afferescence. You could say that ex afferescence is what gives us the impression of a passage of time and also something to operate our reason upon. Now that's all very nice, but not so surprising. Our memory of the past, of course, helps us notice when something new appears, a new sight, sound or smell. This is a process that resonates strongly with the basic operations of science. New empirical observations are evaluated against an earlier model of reality and the model is adjusted or updated. This is basically the way we teach the scientific method. The much overlooked and intriguing matter, however, is that the two physiologists found a second looping process, which they call pre-efferescence. In perception, a second problem arises. While what an animal does may depend on what it sees, the image an animal sees in turn depends on what the animal does. For example, if we, it moves its head, the image of the world will change, even though nothing has moved in the environment. Therefore, even simple animals evolved so-called reafference mechanisms to predict what image they should perceive in future as a result of their own action, so that this imagined image can be compared what is, with what is actually observed by the senses. Action would be utterly impossible to monitor and control without the second loop. Think of hand-eye coordination in catching a ball, for example. If there is a motion in the environment, it can thus be detected reliably, even though the animal is in motion itself, because the potentially confounding effect of the subject's own action have been compensated for by creating this loop through the future. Now, as far as I can tell, the significance of this mechanism has been left somewhat unexplored. Just as ex afferents evolved into higher memory-based rational function, for the postdoc analysis or observations, reafference evolved into a higher imaginal function, allowing animals not just to monitor action from moment to moment, but also to plan by contemplating the various futures their different action sequences could create. All the more curious then is that contemporary humanities should be so unable to imagine a positive desirable future and to act accordingly in the present if the actions we're actually taking lead to suicidal and ecocidal outcomes, why do we persist? Why are we so powerless to change? And I argue it is because we, are, we have failed to do justice to this second and complementary imaginal subject, sub subjectivist function of the mind, which has a crippling effect. Um, and this is repeated in each generation as children are taught in a modernist system of education that has this rationalist objectivist bias and cannot see the importance of imagination. Uh, so for the sake of simplicity, we can think of those two afferents operations uh, at the physiological level as in terms of uh, sensory ex uh, mental experience as imaging and imagining. Imaging of is about the past and imagining about the future. And these cognitive functions are rational and imaginal. All experience that we image and store of the objective past, whereas imagining is about creating virtual images that are not observations, 
but a continuous inner broadcast of projected future states reflecting the expected impact of the subject's own action. Modernist rational science has seriously serious trouble accommodating, accommodating the imaginal function within its objectivist worldview. The consequences are devastating, and unfortunately, the causes are also deeply entrenched, not least within a flawed modernist system of education. That must change. It shouldn't be that the most creative people we have, uh, uh, people like Einstein, like Tesla, were often eccentric, dreamers, misfits, people full of imaginations. They're not, they didn't get where they got by education, but they are survivors of education. It shouldn't have to be like that. To conclude, our senses may be created at telling us what is out there and equally within our body. Reason is created analyzing post hoc how elements of the world relate, the order of things, reality as it is, but it is imagination that helps us picture and choose between different futures. Reason remains tied to what is, the truth, perhaps, which lies in the past by the time we grasp it. But the exclusive worship of reason has led us into an entra entrapment within a kind of hyper-realism, hyper in the sense that this world of images we inhabit is also a world, is, is really just a world that is created, or in the in the words of the tabula smaragdinas, sicut mundus creatus est. That's something we should remember that the worlds, that even the worlds of the past are worlds that have been created. Imagination needs to be reinstated and properly understood as a faculty of higher order thinking par excellence. There's some truth perhaps in the biblical claim that we humans were created in the image, so to speak. For indeed, it is the nature of the human mind to be a, in a world of images. But we are not just knowers of images, we are also image creators. Imagination enables us to recognize ourselves as moral subjects, as creators, as makers of images and of new worlds. Imagination is indeed the vital force that makes conscious action and moral action possible. It is so fundamental that it defines us and in its simplest forms is present in all sentient life. We not, do not need to learn to imagine. What learners need is opportunity to develop their imagination, to share it with others and to, Im and to imagine shared futures together within conscious communities of moral actors. Thank you.